Thank you for joining us for the fourth annual Global Summit on Kidney Innovation, Global Kidney Patient Voice, the key to accelerating innovation, a collaborative partnership event presented by the American Association of Kidney Patients, the George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Science. My name is Dale Rogers and I'm a AAKP Board of Director and member of the AAKP Executive Committee and an AAKP Field Ambassador for the state of Idaho. I'm also a kidney patient. I have experienced hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, and am a current kidney transplant recipient. Six plus years out, and I also received a pancreas transplant. Diagnosed at 12 years old with type 1 juvenile onset diabetes and later hypertension, the two leading causes of kidney failure today. Advocating exclusively with AAKP with Advocacy Hill Days, partnering, participating in advisory boards for industry to provide unique patient insights and representing AAKP in various federal agencies um, and um, also on the SRTR Patient Family Advisory Council to help patients better understand the choices they can make with the transplant centers. Being part of AAKP allows me to share my patient voice at, in situations where patient outcomes is not always the main topic of conversation. As an AAKP member, you can also do the same. This is a critical now, this is critical now that we ha as patients, consumers, raise our voices and create the demand for new diagnostics, devices, and <clears throat> biologics in our independent countries. Through AAKP Global, launched in 2019, AAKP is engaged internationally because we are <clears throat> committed to educating patients and leaders across the globe on the importance of kidney disease prevention, new innovations in treatment, and the opportunity to save more lives. We believe that <clears throat> a united patient voice can drive innovation and the policies decisions that determine timely regulatory regulations and payments for new and safe care treatments. Globally, we are working with patients, medical professionals, researchers, and medical industry allies to cultivate a united consortium led by patients. AAKP believes this international consortium can advance innovation and change kidney care in countries where healthcare systems and or infrastructure do not support patients, cons consumer choice and or access to care treatments. For our session, the future is here, the decade of the kidney and artificial organ innovations in alternatives to dialysis. I am pleased to introduce a very good friend and ally to AAKP, Dr. William Fassell. Dr. Fassell is medical director for the Kidney Project and associate professor of clinical medicine of Vanderbilt University Medical Center. He is also the 2022 recipient of the AAKP Medal of Excellence Awards in the physicians category. We've been honored to have Dr. Faisal join us at various AAKP events since 2016, providing updates on the kidney project as it continues to move forward, concept to potential a solution in the near future 
for those suffering with kidney failure. Welcome, Dr. Fassell. I turn it over to you. Good morning. I'm Bill Fassell. I'm a nephrologist and biomedical engineer at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. And it's my pleasure to present at the AAKP Global Summit some of the work that we've been doing recently to make this ambitious goal of a bioartificial kidney into reality. This talk is going to be a little bit long on scientific detail, uh, but I think it's important that you be able to see exactly what we're doing and why. Our goal over the last 15 years has been really single-minded efforts on developing technologies to help patients who are ill today, rather than developing theories and pursuing discovery science that will make small incremental gains in understanding that are only loosely related to the needs of patients alive today. We like to make the analogy to the difference between understanding climate change with a view towards developing strategies to mitigate harm from a warming world versus the desperate need to give a starving man a glass of water. We're in the glass of water business. I'd like to provide a view of the people who have made this all possible. I might be the person whose voice that you're hearing, but this is the work of many teams over many years. Our original inspiration and my mentor and the man without whom none of this would have happened is Harvey David Humes, a professor at University of Michigan who pioneered the first bioartificial kidney using living kidney cells. I had the incredible good fortune to meet Dr. Shubo Roy, a biomedical engineer then at Cleveland Clinic, who was already working on some of the technologies that we needed to make the bioartificial kidney a reality. He's been a stalwart advocate for patients with kidney disease and a valued and trusted partner in this research for almost 20 years. My lab today is fairly small. Rachel Evans is a biologist and cell culture expert who is responsible for some of the discoveries I'm going to talk about. Dr. Hal Love is a staff scientist who's been responsible for a lot of the biologic questions and answers that underlie the data I'll show you. And Kuniko Hunter is a biomedical engineering graduate student at Vanderbilt University who has been trying to solve some of the metabolic challenges of cells and culture. We have been fortunate in previous years to receive funding from the National Institute of Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering. This is a relatively recent addition to the institutes at the National Institutes of Health, and they have been generous in funding foundational research that cuts across many disciplines. And unfortunately, as we have moved from developing platform technologies like silicon-based membranes to specific applications and even products like a bioartificial kidney, we've moved out from the umbrella of NIH-funded discovery science and have become ever more dependent on the generosity of individuals and foundations who have been touched by the misery of renal disease and who have been aghast at the limited options available to patients who develop kidney failure today. The Wildwood Foundation has funded our research for about 15 years. The Ken and Marsha Goldman Foundation have funded Dr. Roy's laboratory at University of California, San Francisco. And I've been very fortunate to receive funding from the Maria and Bernard Park Family Foundation, among others. Our goal is an implanted bioartificial kidney. We have moved away from the idea of miniaturizing dialysis because dialysis involves disposables and disposables involves replacement. And that's a fundamental barrier to making an artificial kidney that sits underneath the skin and functions continuously without the need 
for ongoing human intervention to replace, for example, sorbent cartridges or to connect to a bedside or a chairside supply of dialysis. Healthy kidneys filter and process almost 2,000 liters of blood every day, and about 8% of that by volume, the GFR that you read about comes up to over 100 liters a day of waste products in plasma water that are then concentrated by these epithelial cells, these tubule cells, from 140 liters a day of filtrate down to a manageable volume, two liters a day, 1.7 liters a day, 1.4 liters a day, a tiny concentrated drops of waste products where that loss, the fluid that you need to be able to excrete the ashes of your body's metabolic fires, that fluid volume can be replaced just by drinking. And this is the architecture of our plan. For the first decade of our project, we developed a novel hemofiltration membrane that takes the place of the kidneys filters, powered only by pressure generated by the patient's heart, no electric motors, no batteries, no drive lines, no tubing. Functions just like a kidney's filter. And I've spent most of the prior presentations I've made to AAKP discussing our successes in bringing this ambitious project to fruition. I'm gonna switch gears and I'm gonna spend the rest of our talk presenting some new data, mostly unpublished data, about our efforts to convince tubule cells to grow in an artificial environment so that they can concentrate tens or a hundred liters of filtered wastes down into a few liters of urine so that a patient who receives our bioartificial kidney can eat and drink and make urine almost like they had a natural kidney. I've showed you this slide before. I'm going to go over it quickly. On the left is a proximal tubule cell from a biopsy from a human patient. And I'd like you to see that up top here where it says BB for brush border is this lush kelp forest of little fingers of cells sticking up into the ultrafiltrate so that every single droplet of filtrate that passes along the tubule can come in contact with the tubule cell. Tubule cells packed with mitochondria, these dark blobs that are the powerhouses that use chemical energy to power this cell to reabsorb salt and water from up here and return it to the bloodstream down here while preventing any waste products from being reabsorbed. And in fact, this cell secretes waste products directly from blood into the urine. It's a fantastically organized cell that our bodies depend on for health. But the moment that you take this cell out of a person and you put it in a lab dish, and this is a human renal proximal tubule cell grown according to current protocols in my laboratory, and you don't see any mitochondria, you don't see this lush lawn of cellular projections, you just see this kind of attenuated bald spot peach fuzz of little fingers. And this was our fundamental challenge. We've been told for decades that our goal of an implantable artificial kidney, using silicon chips as filters and using living cells to concentrate wastes, was doomed because kidney cells in the dish don't work like kidney cells in the person. And when I talked to experts in the field, because I wouldn't call myself an expert in the field, I'm a physicist and an electrical engineer not a cell biologist. I got lost in a literature of embryonic development, of cell signaling molecule, of these kind of wild west charts where there's arrows flying all over the place, depicting how cells respond to various chemicals. My brain just wasn't able to think that way. I was a very linear thinker and I still am. And what I did was just write down some of the differences between a cell culture dish and a healthy human being. That was a long list. It included levels of sugar, levels of insulin, 
fluid flow. It was a long list. One of the things on that list was the mechanical characteristics of the material that we grew the cells on. We typically grow cells on very stiff plastic dishes. And when you do that, you get accustomed to seeing a pattern like this, where each one of these little green circles is a kidney cell. And you can see each cell, you can see the nucleus of the cell, the brain of the cell here in blue. And you can see the tight junctions that bind one cell to the next cell. And we all grew up, in, this is good cell culture. You can see every cell, they're all tightly bound to each other. But there's nothing in you or me that looks like this, that looks like a flat sheet. And so I tried a very simple experiment. What happens if we grow these cells on something that's soft and floppy and resembles the stiffness of healthy human kidney tissue? Well, what actually happens is nearly a miracle. The cells spontaneously form little round balls and cysts and tubes. Growing these cells on a material that resembles healthy tissue yields cells that look like healthy tissue. This was encouraging that maybe we had found something. This is just a pretty picture. This doesn't prove anything. So we asked, well, we talked about what we want these cells to do. We want these cells to reabsorb filtered salt and water. And they do that using a specific protein channel in the cell. So we said, well, does growing these cells on a soft substrate let them make that channel and use it? So we grew cells on conventional plastic dishes, on stiff hydrogels, and on hydrogels that had the stiffness of healthy human kidney tissue. And lo and behold, when we grew the cells for a long time, for four weeks, by coincidence, the same length of time that it tends to take somebody to recover from an episode of acute kidney injury, where these cells are injured. By growing these cells for a month on a floppy substrate, all of a sudden, magically, the cells start making that channel. And we can see that at every step of the so-called central dogma of molecular biology. We can see it at the RNA level, we can see it at the protein level, and we can see it positioned in cells where it's supposed to work. That was encouraging again, but we still hadn't shown that these cells were actually pumping. And there we ran into a problem that slowed us down for almost a year. These soft scaffolds made out of gels are a hassle. They don't let water through them. It's hard to get cells to stick to them. And we said, look it, we have to move away from this technology of these soft floppy gels. We tried a number of approaches until I finally said, aha, if these cells are responding to the stiffness of the support that I'm growing them on, this must be happening through some genetic pathway in the cell, some regulatory pathway. So I asked her and I said, well, what, what, what genes, what proteins, what signaling molecules in tubule cells might be responsive to the stiffness of what the cell is growing on? And everybody I talked to referred to this one cytokine called TGF-beta. And so all I did was I put these cells back on stiff substrates that were porous, and I blocked the action of this one cytokine with the drug. It's commercially available, just buy it. And lo and behold, you grow these cells on stiff, stiff substrates in normal culture conditions. You get a little teeny bit of transport, but not much. But the moment that you block the action of that cytokine, one molecule, one drug, all of a sudden the cells start transporting. So that was encouraging. We got that published a couple years ago. But we went on to ask, is this really happening by the mechanism that we think? So yeah, we can show that by blocking this cytokine, we can get the cells to express the transporter at the mRNA level, at the protein level. But then the key development was that we were able to show that we could block the transport with a diuretic, with a drug. So this is actually happening in the dish the same way that it happens in the person.
The kidney cells do a lot of things besides just moving salt and water. Many of you have heard of these new drugs, canagliflozin, dipagliflozin, these SGLT2 inhibitors. Well, proximal tubule cells also reabsorb sugar. So we asked ourselves, well, since blocking this one cytokine called TGF-beta improves salt transport, what does it do to sugar transport? Well, the transporter protein comes up, both at the gene level and at the protein level, and it pumps sugar from top to bottom, just like a cell in the body does, and you can block that function with an SGLT2. So this was a second note in this chord we're playing that we're able to convince cells to grow in a dish much the way they do in the body. Then we had one last question, one last challenge. We've shown that they reabsorb things and that's important to our mission because we want to concentrate wastes. Can these cells excrete wastes? We classically, in kidney physiology, use a small molecule called hippurate, also abbreviated PAH, as a surrogate for all of the small anionic waste products that the kidneys excrete. It's transported by the same channel called an oat that, for example, secretes creatinine. Well, sure enough, when we block that cytokine, the levels of the oat transporter goes up. When we block that cytokine, the cells start pumping toxins from basolateral blood out into the urine. And when we give a classic drug, probenicid, some of you may have taken probenicid for gout, for example, we block that action. So there you have it. I've showed you today, as I showed you in years gone by, our strategy for developing a continuous implanted artificial kidney. Well, what I've showed you for the first time today is that a relatively simple approach has overcome a very long-standing barrier to development of an artificial kidney. And that is we've overcome the dedifferentiation of cell culture stress. That we've been able to grow cells in an artificial environment that now begin to act like cells in the human body do. It's not just limited to reabsorbing salt water, although that was the key thing that we needed. They're also reabsorbing sugar and they're also excreting waste products. My aunt had polio as an infant and my aunt's life was saved by an iron lung. This is a polio ward. We don't use iron lungs today. Iron lungs saved countless lives with their museum pieces today. My goal is that in 20 years, we have a picture that looks just like this of a dialysis unit. That we can look back and say, dialysis saved half a million lives a year in the United States, but we don't use dialysis anymore. That's my goal. I'm gonna close with a quote from Pim Kolf, the first physician to successfully use dialysis to treat renal failure. I chose this quote because it's emblematic of the situation that my laboratory is in. I'm trying to do something simple and I'm really struggling to get funding for an applied project to make a box that alleviates human suffering. Kolf was in the same predicament. He said, it's nearly impossible to obtain funding for something simple. Therefore, over the years, my laboratory has teetered along, always on the rim of bankruptcy, always having too many ideas and too little money to carry them out. It's a pleasure to share with you the progress that we've been making year in and year out towards this ambitious goal of an implantable artificial kidney. I look forward to sharing more progress with you in the years to come. Thank you, Dr. Fassell. We are always excited to hear about the outgoing, the ongoing progress being made with the Kidney Project.